So um, that segues us perfectly into the first panel discussion that we want to have today. Um, the panel is entitled My Hardware, My Choice, and we want to discuss the right to repair, the impacts this has on sustainability, <clears throat> on the different creation of value chains, so also economic impact around the world, and also on, of course, our cultures and how we deal with technology and treat it. And I have three excellent people to discuss these topics here with me today. I would like to give a very warm welcome to Teresa Dillon. She is an artist and researcher exploring the live, lived entanglements of techno-civic uh, systems, currently focusing on topics of repair, care, maintenance, and healing cultures. <clears throat> She's here representing Repair Acts as a pluralistic, artistic-led research program that explores <clears throat> exactly these topics of care, repair, maintenance, and healing cultures. Uh, please give her a big warm round of applause and welcome Teresa Dillon to the stage. Great to have you here, Teresa. Um, an equally big round of applause to Max Fort, who is the head of the Prototype Hardware Fund at the Open Knowledge Foundation. He's also recently founded the German Open Hardware Alliance and is really an important spokesperson on these topics here in Germany. Please give him a big round of applause as well. And now I'm looking a little bit nervously into the room because I'm not 100% sure that Martin Ulu from Fab Lab Winham is here already for our panel. Oh, well, join, exactly. And let's have a hot seat because, of course, we need to hear also um, voices from outside of Europe on this topic. So we'll start with the two fantastic panelists that we have. And, um, and then hopefully we'll be able to welcome Martin on the panel. But if somebody else from the gay community also wishes to speak on these topics, let's just make this a fishbowl discussion. And then you're welcome to join us up here on stage. So please don't hesitate to jump the stage for this. Um, all right, so I would love to, I just gave you tiny short introductions. So as a beginning round, I would love for you guys to talk a little bit more about your work, how you are t approaching these topics. And yeah, and especially like, I'd love to start with you, Teresa, if you can tell me a little bit more about how Repair Acts works and your specific perspective and narrative that you're approaching these topics with. Sure, yeah, is it possible to run the presentation? Did you add it to the folder? Yes, then I'm looking over to the kind man at the tech desk. I've got two in there, kind man at the tech desk. One says PDF and one says full media. If you can take full media, that would be great. Anyway, while we're doing that, um, I'll explain. So I hold the post of Professor of City Futures at the School of Art and Design in Bristol, in the, which is um, situated within the University of the West of England. And for the last about 10 years, I have been looking at the, uh, the topic, as, as uh, Geraldine introduced, of repair and extending that to notions of care, repair, maintenance and healing cultures. Specifically, this has focused actually on material entanglements and relationships that we have with our products, with it tying very much into the loop of the right to repair movement. And it has manifested in particularly in different ways, in a very situated way, because I would make the case that actually repair is almost best placed when it is placed based. It is site based and situated. So much of our work has been looking at the role of local repair economies. And what we have been doing is some desk-based research where we've been going back to the 30s, like post-World War, sort of World War II onwards, and taking 20-year slices to look at the changes in repair ecologies and economies in local places. And that's, this has given us really rich data and a very unique data set. And we've been doing this work. Ah, uh, woohoo, there you go. <laughs> um, right, so I have to say, swap sli uh, have I got the control? Thank you very much. Look at this. Thank you for making this possible. Gig, known for its smoothness. Um, wonderful. Okay, so this is one of our slogans uh, from 2017. Um, part of our work, of course, is in this intersection of art practices, um, desk-based research, and um, which is situated in the humanities and social sciences, and also what would be called kind of community art perspectives as well. 
So Repair Axe is, as has been introduced as a pluralistic artist-led research group. And what I was speaking to was how this work is very much situated in a very deep and local level within landscapes and infrastructures and in, in association with communities, governing bodies, craft, artisan and skilled trades, professions, and looking then at how the law and legislation manifests in those particular areas. Regarding defining repair cultures, this looks at aesthetics, economies and practices, and also the laws that govern this as well. I'm giving, I'm going to go and whip through this just because of the time. What I wanted to really highlight here was this work that I was just mentioning in terms of desk-based research. And I just want to point here to 1938 and 2018. Thir 1938 here, this is taken in Bristol in a square mile. So that's about like a kilometre of, of, of where I live in Bristol, you see the richness and diversity here of the local repair economies. Essentially, you could get all of those things repaired, shoes, bikes, linen, the plaster on your brick on, on your walls for your houses, bricks. When it comes down to 2018, some of those have completely and utterly disappeared. If we were to just look at that top purple line, that is throwaway culture in relation to clothes only. All the clothes that you could get repaired in 38, that top purple bit, zero pretty much in 2018. That's actually a dry cleaners, which goes very minimal repair. And I could speak to any one of those particular colors with the monopolization then in local repair uh, cultures actually really to do with your mobile phone. So when we actually look then at electronic repair services, we see again the disappearances of TV and um, radio, for example, and then um, the mobile phone, of course, really being one of the key repairs that are kind of happening. And anyone working on local repair phone um, economies and cultures will also know that that's actually sometimes quite limited. It's sometimes just a battery repair <laughs> or, or, or a battery change quantifies as the repair, for example. It's not necessarily what we might call deep or sophisticated repairs. So this type of work gives very, very, very powerful data sets, basically, through which we can kind of lobby local governments. Another very important aspect of our work, and I'll shout out here if he wants to join us on the hot seat, is Felipe um, Schmidt-Fonseca's work in Brazil as well, where we've been looking at local repair cultures. Corey mentioned uh, uh, Jukad in terms of India's uh, word for example of the hatch and Gambia is the one in Brazil. We've been collecting these stories of everyday repair, including again, creating database where people upload the costs of what they have repaired and, and, and how they have repaired it and their motivations. And this again, gives us a very rich pitch, picture, but it also speaks to the actually um, monetary values of local repair uh, shops as well. And then exhibition in communities, in rural communities, working with farmers, working with local practitioners to understand how we can essentially, um, will this work? Nope. That, that's a video we uh, creating documentaries, which is a 45 minute documentary on changes in relation to local skilled practices. What we're finding across Europe in terms of the broader non-digital, so I'm talking about stonemasons, I'm talking about sewing, I'm talking about textile repair, I'm talking about um, bricklaying and traditional uh, housing construction, all of heritage, what one might call heritage repair. We are actually seeing a demise of these professional skills trade practices in Europe. And this is also echoed in our work in India, and it's also echoed in our work in Brazil. Multiple issues here in relation to the devaluing of those practices from an educational perspective. We're in a crisis moment where handicraft and trade has been devalued. And this is what Turning the Collar is actually looking at. And so therefore, collecting stories of existing practitioners who are out there and why they are motivated to do their work is very important for us to actually highlight. And I'm going to just close with this last piece of work at, around legislation that we do. We work in local communities to crowdsource essentially statements where people would like to change their repair uh, cultures in their local area. And the declarations become very powerful um, ways through which we can lobby with local government. So we work in a deep way with senates and local councils. And the, the one here that I'm going to highlight is from Westmeath, which is an area in, in the middle of Ireland that I grew up in. And now we're working with the local council in the same way we are working with, with, with Bristol. And what these demands and calls for highlight is a, as a methodology through which we can say, okay, if you're serious about fostering repair cultures locally, make sure there's tax 
breaks and VAT repairs, uh, uh, breaks on VAT, for example, on repairs. Look at mobile repair units if we're going to be working in rural con uh, contexts. What, what are the ways that we're going to implement it within in an educational perspective? How do we create trusted networks of professional repair services so that older people can actually feel safe and secure when the, a person of a trade is coming into their homes? All of these things, including then, of course, the, the manufacturing transparency and what are the types of repair that are really needed in a local kind of way. And this gives us a guide point now, which we're kind of rolling out and looking to how we can implement this then in a practical way across the next 10 years. So that's a quick summary of the interface between art, um, social design, expanded community practices and spatial practices that we work in. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Teresa. Yeah, you, please applaud. <laughs> Also highly recommend the Repair Act website as a resource. Uh, it's a very rich website and, and I'm sure a lot of um, things that you can find there uh, to dig a bit deeper into the things that Teresa just shared that she's working on. Max, I'd also like to invite you to talk a little bit about, before we get to some of the common themes here, a bit about your work at um, the Open Knowledge Foundation with the Prototype Hardware Fund, how this was finally created, why it's so important, but maybe you can also share a little bit of information on this newly founded Open Hardware Alliance. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, I can just connect to you because um, I really like this understanding of um, uh, that repair is something which connects us with, uh, to our objects. I think this relationship to our objects is very important if it comes to like uh, taking care of them and uh, being interested in how they function and like also like being interested in the in the systematic in which they are like produced. I think this is very important if it comes also to uh, political action. So very nice that you uh, work on this and. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's also something which is connected to the topics I'm interested um, in. So um, I work, as you already said, for the Open Knowledge Foundation um, on the uh, topic of open hardware. And uh, with uh, my colleague um, Daniel Veselek, we started the Prototype Fund for open hardware. And it's uh, about transparency for objects, for hardware. Because um, I think it's clear, but uh, if we talk about transparency, if we talk about hardware, then we talk about power. I think um, this is a very important thing. Uh, if we look also at the production system, giving us information about the objects is about giving us power to like take an ownership. So um, this is what we try to do with the prototype fund for open hardware. And yeah, we could um, start our first funding round. I think there's also one object there which was part of it, the Libre Water project. It's very interesting. Um, uh, so take a look at this. And um, yeah, so th this is the first thing. I think if we talk about like ownership, then getting access to our object is very important and be, being able to repair, I think uh, open hardware gives us this opportunity. But what, what we also need is this kind of open spaces, um, open workshops, this is the, like, like the German word for it, but we know these kind of spaces called maker spaces, hacker spaces, fab labs. I think um, we need both uh, if we uh, want to have like the power in the civil society to take ownership of our objects. And this is the second hand hat with I'm here. Um, I'm uh, also part of the Verbund offener Werkstätten. Uh, this is the German network of open workshops. Um, so I'm part of the um, board there. And we have more than 400 open workshops in Germany, also repair cafes and so on. And um, yeah, it's still a, like a vibrant and growing network and it's very nice to see all this um uh yeah this this um power in this movement and uh, i hope we can um make a uh yeah uh, we we can we can change something in the current process of um the policy making and we are done <laughs> <laughs> great so policy making is a good um, key word here because there's a lot happening at the policy side in Europe at the minute. We have this new agenda for consumer protection in Europe and in March, I believe, they issued the right to repair directive, which is a part of that. So there's finally a bit of movement. I think a lot of us in our community were waiting for this for a long time, sort of inspired 
looking at Scandinavian countries who've had right to repair uh, for a longer time, that this is something that would gain traction in Europe. So I would like to uh, know from you, and, and again, everybody, please feel free to take this hot seat as it looks like Martin is not going to make it, but we would definitely like to hear some um, perspectives from outside of Europe on this as well. Um, how you feel this right to repair can be operationalized. You just show this screen to show we have lost all this um, talent, we have lost all these skills, we have lost all these places to go to to actually get our things repaired. What is this directive going to do? How can we actually turn it into practice? Um, do you, can, you, uh, can you start? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess for anyone in the audience who might not be familiar with the right to repair laws and legislations that came in. In some ways, actually, the US has been leading the conversation um, as a number of states there implemented right to repair laws um, in the last sort of five years. And this has been a very slow build up as well from ifixit.org, for example, who have been leading that in terms of the repair coalitions that are set up there. And that impetus really was part of a global movement then with Europe bringing in the laws in 2021 was a big year for European right to repair laws that came in. And they mainly focus on things like that spare parts can be in circulation for the next 10 years on particular white goods. So it's very limited to certain types of goods, that the manuals that are related to those goods are also clear and easy to read. Well, not necessarily easy to read, but accessible and downloadable. And also that there are certain kind of um, elements regarding repairability in terms of who you can kind of uh, professional warranty breakage, etc. Um, groups, though, like Restart in London, for example, and those laws then were implemented within the UK because, of course, since uh, the UK leaving the EU, it had to also reimagine its own stuff, but just essentially borrowed everything that was Europe was doing. So um, <laughs> it basically kickstarted the same laws in July in, in 2021. And then the, what you're speaking about in terms of the digital passport, that has come in then um, in terms of this year, which is also all of these things are part of the green, what's called the Green New Deal in Europe. So for those of you that might not be familiar, that's the kind of general context. Next. The problem is that with these right to repair laws, they're, as I mentioned, they're limited to particular kind of goods. Funnily enough, within Europe, they were covering laptops and smart uh, phones. When it came to Europe, mm, or sorry, when it came to the UK, they were not necessarily covered. Is that a question of somebody doing some very good lobbying? I don't know, because essentially when you look at what are the goods that are being most repaired, they are tending to be laptops and mobile phones at the moment because they're the powerful consumer goods that we have in our hand. Um, it doesn't also enable the community uh, right to repair, the community cafes, uh, maker spaces, uh, repair cafes. They don't fall under this legislation at the moment. So res Restart in London, who are a charity or an NGO that work to promote repairability in wider contexts, are also now got an active live petition, which I encourage us all to sign, to sort of say, make those laws cover those particular spaces. And I think that's really, really critical, essentially, to what we're wanting to kind of change when it comes to these kind of policies. Um, and the digital passport adds another layer to this, which, you know, I think is also, again, very uh, based, essentially, on particular uh, products. It's very uh, dependent on the industry getting itself together quickly and fast. And it's essentially a QR code that would be on a product that would allow you to scan it and sort of see the, the, the food labeling system, in a sense, that's applied now to products. France in 2021, at the beginning of 2021, also brought in the repairability index. And I think this is actually much more interesting in terms of the question of repairability rather necessarily than the, than the passport in a sense. Because I see the passport, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit critical of the passport, oh, the way that it's been rolled out at the partic this particular moment in time. Um, and also I think that it's going to leave itself wide open for um, hacking and greenwashing and all sorts of stuff like this. And you, can, you don't have to be, you know, uh, inside the field to kind of see how that would kind of end up happening. So the repairability index in France essentially applies to about six different products at the moment, including lawnmowers, which I think means that there's a lot of <laughs> gardeners. 
I love the way that some products get covered and others don't and what might be actually the rationale behind that. You know, there's, there's part of me that would like to weird out about why those decisions <laughs> landed. But France and lawnmowers always makes me chuckle. Um, but it's about 10 different c uh, categories, um, if, I'm if I'm remembering correctly. And they're, they also grade basically on scales regarding to, you know, what's, again, spare parts, manuals, um, um, documentation, etc. And that's the repairability system. So I think that's pretty interesting. And I think we should start to see this being encouraged in other countries as well. Absolutely. Thank um, you. Please. Yeah, um, you ask um, how we could do uh, or make this happen. And I think we already make this happen, but we have uh, still ha don't have the access for the right spare parts. And there is not much information about the objects. And if we look at the right to repair um, uh, law making process, um, there is like an, um, an, um, uh, a paper which were like... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, which which we saw, I think, in April about this process, and we are really at the end of, of this lawmaking thing, and this paper is like, um, it's nothing. It's not a right to repair um, law. It's like more an invitation for companies to repair um, if it's not more expensive than just like replacing the uh, thing, and um, um, there's nothing really uh, written about like giving us information, so I think um, there are people who are already making this happen, and there are like a lot of repair cafe initiatives, and there are of course um, also companies who are um, into repair and so on but uh, we are still lacking of this information and um, I think is it everything is part of a bigger system which like um, the EU calls uh, um, the, the circular economy and uh, I more um, prefer the, 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 the um, word um, circular society um, so the repair is one thing of it, and the product passport might be also part of it, like if it comes to like being able to get um, some materials out of the objects uh, which uh, surrounds us. But I think, uh, as you already said, it, this is not much. It's, uh, at the moment, it's uh, a lot about like the giving the free market some incentives to operate, but there is not like a law... Um, uh, framework which like really shifts the system to um, yeah what we really need to uh, like a circulating um, economy so um, yeah so <laughs> I could give you the microphone so <laughs> I think I'm ready <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome on stage, Linda Bonio. It's lovely to see you. I really want to run over and give you a hug, actually, because I haven't been able to do that today. So let me just quickly do that. You'll be seeing Linda on stage again at the last session that we have. She's from Lawyers Hub in Kenya. I'll give you a longer introduction then, but over to you now. Thank you. I just want to say that I've been forced to come on stage. Hi, Sandra. <laughs> Um, I was really intrigued by the conversation that you're having, um, and especially on the laws. Um, I, I wasn't aware about all this happening, so I was really intrigued by, by what could happen in Africa. Um, the Lawyers Hub works on regulations around technology, and I think this is amazing um, to learn from and to pick from it. Um, and just to say that we've been studying the, um, the correlation between European laws and African laws, and one of our learnings is that Africa really borrows from, the, from Europe. Um, I think last week um, I was at an event in um, at the Nobel Prize Summit and somebody said that how did Europe become a super legislator in technology? Um, many of the world didn't see that coming, especially because of the innovation happening in, in Europe cannot be compared to what's happening in Europe, in, in the US. But I think what the US has done is to build technologies and then be overwhelmed with legislating it. And so then they have exported the, every tendency to make sure that the big corporates really have the power and the small people don't have the power. Um, but then also, too, um, I see the essence of having maybe anti-dumping laws because of what happens is um, technologies don't work in the West and they 
make, then they come to Africa as donations. Um, and yet we don't need that. We actually need um, something that works and not something that, um, for instance, you look at maybe X-ray machines, a lot of them would ideally be coming from the West um, and not usable maybe in three or four years. And so I, I just wanted to say that this is a great um, sort of discussion and um, I'd be really happy to look at, you know, exactly what's, what the laws look like, what we could learn from it. And we notice that even though, even if we don't pick the laws, the governments will pick the laws. Um, I like what you said about the circular economy and a lot of funding into Africa now uh, from Europe is on the, uh, the circular economy. And we know that this will come up as legislation. And so I'm really glad that this has been highlighted. So thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. And uh, I think that's also a good point to think about, like, how is this going to impact different kind of value chains? I said in the opening um, couple of sentences, obviously, this has a lot of sustainability topics connected to it, but it also potentially has a lot of economic topics connected to it. Um, maybe, Teresa, I know we met in Republica Accra. That's where we know each other from. Um, and you were working a lot with communities that basically live on all the electronic trash we transport to Ghana. Maybe you can share a little bit about that work with us as well today. Yeah, so I think from the start of Parax, it was really important um, that we had conversations with countries that were outside of Europe. So the, one of our first partners was Toxic Links in India, who's, um, who've been working for the last 30 years on changing environmental policies in relating to e-waste, both in India and actually on a global level. And also then working in Brazil with Gambiologia, who have been also, again, working for the last decade, thinking from an artistic and design perspective about reuse of uh, tech and overflow. What I should say, though, um, is that both of those countries have extremely rich, vibrant, what I would call everyday cultures of repair, where actually the idea even of talking about repair cultures is like, eh. What are you talking about, Teresa? We do this without even, you know, needing to kind of like embody it or intellectualize it um, in the same way as you are doing in, in Europe. Um, and, and so that's kind of why I emphasize that actually when we speak about repair cultures and repair societies and circular economies, they are situated, you know, they are placed based and we have to kind of look at actually what are the conditions within uh, particular cities and towns and villages then countries and states etc so while I do agree that it's extremely important from uh, a societal level to have laws, uh, laws don't necessarily do much until they're implemented, really, in a way. So the right to repay laws haven't really necessarily been enforced, as, as, as Max was pointing out. And so, you know, we could be in a very slippery slope that all of these wonderful circular economy kind of laws get uh, you know, out there, and I'm not trying to dismiss the efforts, the, they're massive efforts, but like, again, it's it, the, the, the devils are in the details, really, in a sense. So what we've been doing then is trying to flip that and sort of look like, well, what if you did a ground up approach, in a sense, to actually, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it lawmaking, but change making, so that when you do these crowdsourced uh, declarations, and you do that in partnership with a Senate or a council, actually, then you start getting kind of groundswell collective notions of actually what does a meaningful repair culture look like in a place and then that can actually then um, have methodologically sort of be um, let's say adopted in Africa or in India or in Brazil and then that as a sort of scaffold then can be applied within the place that it is because if you're you know walking down any sort of main street you know there's like there's literally we call them Keats here in, in Germany, but like hoods or neighborhoods in both in, in many of the African cities, but, but also my, my context of, I guess, deeper knowledge is in India that are all just focused on repair. And, and even, you know, you might walk down, as, as many of you probably know, one particular street that's just shoe repair and another one that's just, or, or as you say, these larger pieces. And then when we were in Ghana and we were working with filmmakers who had actually been um, working for many years on a documentary around those who are the e, the uh, e-waste workers in a sense and it was the same toxic links of 30 years you know of working with uh, the informal sector I mean these are there's so much to unpack here 97 percent of people working in India are in informal precarious no secured situations 
you know? And when you look at who's doing the green work on the ground in these countries, you know, these are the conditions that these people are living in. They're very, very poor conditions. They're toxic conditions. And, and when you look at where those people are migrating from, they're often coming from very poor rural contexts or situations of conflict. Um, and, and as a result, they're migrating into the city to work in these toxic zones. And these are the green workers of the future. So cop on the rest of Europe, <laughs> really, to the people who are really doing the work to make our, you know, snazzy right to repair kind of look like it's like, if we were really to shift the discourse, we would actually be, you know, going right down to the kind of the root of some of these issues and speaking to right, okay, if this is how this global flow of products is going to kind of work, you know, how can we have some just justice in this sort of process in, in terms of the, the um, passport, the digital passport, you know, this is, this is what I mean. And, you know, it's only like, it's only skimming on the surface because if you're going to really push that out, that digital passport might actually particularly be linked to a person who's on the ground doing that work and saying, you know what, I'm going to give them a better wage and a fair wage and a just wage, you know. So, um, yeah, that's my two sense. Thank oh. you. Do you want to add to that? And then I think I'd, uh, yeah, just some additions and then maybe opening up for some questions and comments. I saw some of you nodding along a lot there. Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, shortly add, um, at the moment we try to get information from the companies who are already like creating our technology and I think um, this is very important if it comes to those things which are already there, but I think um, we need to like rethink um, our technology and like creating them openly in a general way and this is connected to like kinds of uh, um, new um, um, ways of making business it's it's about like community creating communities and it's a, and it's about uh, open design and um, I think this is why open hardware is very important um, if it comes to this discussion about repairing and having a um, circular society and um, yeah I, I just uh, wanted to to make this um, again uh, a bit uh, clear and uh, this is also that what we want to do with the prototype fund like helping people really want to start rethinking technology in an open way I think maybe one uh, um, object is um, uh, known here it's um, the MNT reform it's a notebook created in um, Berlin's a very nice um, open hardware laptop, like the first really full open hardware laptop. And we like created, uh, not, not only he, he and his company created everything like in a new way. He has a very, very nice documentation of this um, laptop and um, he has, uh, he, he can make a li life on, on uh, like creating and uh, selling this uh, thing. And uh, there are already people, like I think in the US there's um, a woman who like, um, just uh, created their own laptop on this documentation. So the, she didn't buy one, she just created um, their own. And she's changed a lot to, to their own uh, um, like needs. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate um, those kind of people who like, really want to go and be innovative in a like, different way, not like really thinking about every really thinking about new objects, it's more about rethinking the objects we already have in an open way. And um, well, we talked about this on the forum Open Hardware. I just brought uh, this um, uh, small um, piece here, which, um, uh, which uh, contains uh, the whole discussion, unboxing black boxes. Peter Troxer also wrote an article um, on this. And um, yeah, if somebody wants to uh, get one of this, um, uh, please uh, just uh, call me. And um, another thing what, what I want to add is um, this Open Source Hardware Alliance really try to like foster um, those kind of initiatives and uh, bring together those in initiatives who like really want to yeah, rethink hardware in this way I mentioned. Thank you very much. I mean, luckily there are a lot of people in the room doing exactly that. Um, great, we already have a question. Um, um, is there anybody who wants to share anything about their open hardware work or projects that link on to what Max and Teresa just said? Please join us. Also give me a sign of hand. And otherwise, I will come over to you now for question. Franz, lovely to see you. All right, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, how would the economy look like if this becomes very big and successful? I mean, currently, if you look at a product like an Apple phone, 
or a product like a BMW car. And there is an economic incentive for Apple to create a walled garden, to create, uh, to basically be able to make uh, whatever $150 profit on each hardware sold that is allowed to enter that walled garden of the iOS ecosystem. Or similarly, if you have a BMW, uh, the car itself is without any profit, but then the aftermarket, this is where the company is able to profit from having the ability that a large part, I don't know, two thirds of the spare parts are highly interconnected and that makes it possible for BMW to exclude any competing aftermarket spare part uh, uh, producers to, to bring them onto the market. So it's part of today's reality of the business model, how it works. And it's also part of what various regulations and trips of, on the international level and so on are protecting. So this is the status quo. So how would companies look like? How would products look like? And what would be the necessary economic and uh, legal incentives to make products look like differently? Uh, look into the future. Thank you. You go first. Um, yeah, this is the, like the, the, the initial or the, the really, this is a good question. So um, I think we are in the process on like rethinking this. And uh, uh, there are like, as I mentioned, m and Reform and those kind of companies who try to, 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 to figure out how we could do this. But I think there's not, not, there's not a, like a general like, qu um, answer to this. Like just go this way and then it, um, uh, it uh, um, uh, will be possible, I think. Um, the first thing is really supporting those people who really try to rethink um, this uh, this whole process, and this is something what I um, at the moment uh, don't see. We just like these kind of people, as I uh, mentioned, this MNT reform guy, Lucas um, uh, is his name. He um, if he talks about this, like making this happen, he says it is very hard for him to like uh, convince for example um foundations to give him money um to invest in in his idea because um it's uh, always connected to like okay you need to um have a patent on it and um this kind of cultural um way of making an inv an innovation happen and um he uh yeah he's kind of hacking the system and um uh, i think this is something what we need we need more people people hacking the system and uh, um, I think it's a long way, and it's a hard way, but um, I think it's possible. So I don't have this <laughs> like, like this easy an um, uh, answer to, to um, your question. Yeah, I think what I would sort of say is sort of maybe top things that would happen. We'd see a, a larger scale secondhand parts economy that would be vibrant and rich. It wouldn't be full of debadged items. There would be clear tagging and serial numbers and understanding of where those parts would be. Manufacturers would have to demand, we would, we would demand from manufacturers that part. There would be universal designs so that there's not like lock in to particular design aspects. This is what you're talking about with BMW, for example. You know, why? why is there three thirds or whatever you mentioned there in terms of their closed system loop is because they're like, you know, doing these very bespoke parts to their particular kind of car and particular kind of engine. That's actually not needed. And then what also we would see is a reduction in consumption. That in the end of the day is what we're looking for. You know, that's what Repair Axe is trying to drive towards. We do not need to be consuming at the level that we are consuming. You would be having less things and they would be of higher quality and you would be able to repair them. You know, and it's just, I want to say it's as simple as that. It's not, but it is as simple as that. But getting there, of course, is not simple. A colleague of mine does a really nice little kind of conversation piece where she goes, go back 50 years, the average house was made of, you know, seven to 12 materials. Now there's over a thousand in them. You know, so it's, it's, it's you know, I'm not trying to, dis complex design, we need complex design for some things. We don't need necessarily complex design for all things, you know, so there's like balances within that. But I think that's, that would be one of the main sort of drives if you ask what is the societal change. Thank you, fantastic. Emilio, thank you for joining us on stage. Emilio Vélez, the um, Executive Director of Apropedia. Great to have you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add one example that uh, one of our funders and partners on Apropedia has been working on, which is the fact that 
Um, in the case of medical equipment, there's donations mostly of uh, equipment going to low-income countries. But with the uh, inability to repair, there's also the lack of documentation to uh, repair in places that are inaccessible. And that creates a big problem for um, organizations who are donating to low-income countries because they bring in ventilators or uh, medical equipment that's super expensive, that's necessary to save lives, and nobody's able to fix it. Yeah. And we've seen that. I think that case really came, um, uh, became very visible during the pandemic with people struggling to fix uh, materials. So, so um, the solution that they're uh, proposing is to create documentation and to create an alliance for proprietary medical equipment to say, OK, we will create documentation for people to um, fix them in places. So it doesn't, it even um, damages proprietary um, hardware in that sense. Yeah, in Noah's interest. Um, thank you. That's a really important point added. Felipe, you'd raise your hand. Would you like to ask a question? OK, we'll have one more question, and then we'll round it off on the panel. Oh, somebody else? OK, we'll collect these two <laughs> questions, and then we'll round it off. Can you? But there was, a one. <coughs> there was, was another one first, right? Who's the other one? Felipe, I think we'll, we'll collect those. Yeah, you'll be the last okay, one. Um, I have a question um, about the community repair um, aspect because right, right to repair is often misunderstood as a right to repair for, for the uh, big companies. And this is what we, we lack of understand by, in the fight for the right to repair because what we're, the, the legislation is driving more, more and more step by step to more power for the, for the big enterprises. And in Germany, for example, the, the big argument for lowering the uh, um, access to information tools and tutorials is safety concerns. Because the people are too dumb to repair their stuff because they die if they open up devices. How is that tackled in, in your countries? Do they even care? I, I think the, the, the aspect that you mentioned in first and all these e-wastes donated to other countries, there was a very interesting art piece, a documenta, return to sender. Return the shit to sender. Nobody needs the e-waste from, from Europe in the, in the other countries. But what I really, it's a question, how do, is this safety aspect for, for, for the concern of your health and life, is that really an issue? How is it in your project? Oh, sorry. No. Me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, I could just say two things. So the, the right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The the um, the community right to repair movement. So the restart. Um, Penetition that I was speaking to that's trying to ensure that the right to repair law and legislation as it currently exists does apply to community repairs so that if you repair something in a repair cafe, you're not breaking the, the law, right? So that is trying to happen at the moment. The interesting thing regarding our conversations with those that are working on the field in Ghana and in e-waste dumps in India, when we sort of said, would you not want this on your patch? The thing is, it's a very complicated scenario because those that work in those places are saying, no, we still would want this type of work. This gives us a better wage than X type of work. This, you know, so I think we can't, this is, we could talk about this all day, to be honest with you. Like, you know, and I know you know that, but um, it, it it, it's again, this is why I bring this word just back into it. I think that we need to work with everyone that is representative in this gig kind of space in terms of global south, northern, and you know, in the north. Because when it, you look into trying to change those things, it's not as clean cut as 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 just saying no, don't have my e-waste on, on on your ground. You know, um, it, it's about reimagining. I think all of these chains in a very, very, very different way that allows. Um, yeah, a very complex situation to kind of change. Thank you. Did you want to answer? I want, I want to 
Okay, then we'll have Philippa first, and then we'll get, get, only have a few minutes left, so let's all keep it. Yeah, I guess yeah. just a, a quick comment about the whole ecosystem thinking and how would, I don't know, BMW survive? I, I know I'm in Germany, but, you know, screw them or unscrew them maybe to repair. Um, <laughs> but I think we have to be wary about the kind of greenwashing that is associated with circular economy and the way these things make into the global south. I met people in Brazil who were involved with circular economy and I, I was not invited again to, uh, after the first time I've been to their event because they are trying to import a model that is based only on the perspective from the industry. And, uh, you know, on, on the long run, I don't care about the survival of the present practices and current practices of the industry, but I, I think there should be a lot of thought into how to subvert those, even those funds that come from Europe to implement circular economy in other parts of the world, how do we make that not only on circular but other shapes and other forms, and not to make that only as a way to create closed system loops that will only provide reliable sources of material for the industry to keep doing what they do today. So I guess it's, it's a matter of, you know, in our case in Brazil, tropicalizing these concepts of uh, m making these kind of hybrid uh, arguments with local cultures and with local demands and with local communities with people on the center. And I'll talk about, more about reuse and repair Monday at Republica <laughs> and more about policy this afternoon here. So. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add that um, this is one of the aspects that is, it is mentioned but not put a lot of attention to when we speak about patents is the asymmetry that it creates in low and high income countries, um, especially because it creates a dependency from the parts that are coming uh, and uh, yeah, like uh, living in the global south, it takes weeks or months to have a spare part to repair something, right? So uh, <laughs> for those of us, uh, yeah, like um, it's very complicated car parts, uh, whatever, right? Uh, and that, in the end, is trying to create a dependency, economic dependency, and also technical one, right? It devalues the work of the people who repair in our countries. So that, that is a big problem that has to be considered, um, especially because in the case of making, for example, when someone makes in, in a country, a low-income country, and the, we patent something, it doesn't, the patent isn't worth as much as someone, for example, in my case, I live in El Salvador, someone in the United States can patent, and they have more value because they have a bigger market, and then they can patent in my country, and it's much cheaper, right? And then they can exert that pressure. So it's the same, like, with the repair, if that is the kind of thing that it creates, it's impossible for us to, to, to break that grip if we're not outside of that system. So yeah, I, I think it really, uh, yeah, resonates. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just like to add a few things to the same topic. It is, uh, uh, going on, so yeah, I'm just from India. So uh, there's a big, big thing uh, on repair in India. So I'd let's just add uh, one is the mobile phones, and it's big uh, uh, market. Um, billion of devices are there. So we have few startups like Cashify. You can exchange your old phones uh, by giving old phones, and then uh, they repair it down. And uh, obvious, uh, Amazon is having good things. So they are just selling refurbished products online by repairing it, fixing it few, and then selling it. So it's like big, big, uh, I would say, uh, 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 market also, and you know, uh, uh, great things on uh, repair. And uh, yes, uh, I don't know nothing about uh, repair r law on repair, because we are just repairing <laughs> everything. So yeah, so thank you. <laughs> so um, I have a well, a question regarding ownership. So when we are buying anything, let's say whether it's an electronic item or any other article with our own money, so that belongs to us at the end of the day. So how is it possible that repairing something that belongs to us suddenly becomes illegal or unlawful? Uh, I don't quite get it because at the end of the day, even if I'm you know, <clears throat> replacing one component with something else, I'm not copying any kind of component, so there's no patent, uh, what do you call patent verletzung, or you know whatever it is. 
So. Well, Corey Doctorow would have loved this question because this is something that he uh, talks about a lot in his talks, and I really invite you also, to, if you're going to be a Republican, to join that session because, um, unfortunately, that is the thing. Digital rights management um, makes any product that has been digitized, made smart, a trap, basically, for anybody who wants to have this kind of ownership that you're speaking about. And that's also what Corey was referencing in his talk earlier with John Deere. You used to buy a tractor, you used to own the tractor, you used to be able to fix the tractor, but now the tractor has a software that allows you not to fix that tractor. And this uh, problem of software obsolescence connected to hardware is exactly a very important part of this conversation. So thank you for raising this point. I'm going to use this as a, um, as a segue into the closing of this panel. Um, I want to really thank you for the discussion. Thank you, Emilio and Linda, for taking the hot seat and filling in for Martin. We're very sorry to have missed Martin on the stage here, but you will be able to see him at Republica also at the panel we're having on distributed manufacturing on Tuesday evening. So I hope to see a lot of you there. I think this is a very important conversation to globalize this conversation that's taking place in Europe at the minute for all the reasons that have been shared and also the perspective that you're working on and bringing in Teresa, we're focused so much on these innovation paradigms, mostly leading to the profit margins of individual companies uh, with patented products. But we really also need to have different narratives around repair and care if this green transition thing is going to work out. So thank you so much for being here. Let's have a big round of applause for this panel, please.